A train arrives at a station in Eastern Europe in 1964. Among the passengers are the cast of a legendary production by the Royal Shakespeare Company of King Lear. The lead role is played by one of the greatest actors of his generation, Paul Schofield. Executing fires, vaunt couriers awoke, cleaving thunderbolts, singed my white head. In 2004, an opinion poll among Royal Shakespeare Company members acclaimed Schofield's Lear as the greatest performance in their history. He was one of the most respected of actors, but also one of the most enigmatic. Paul was a mysterious man, but very giving, very open, very naive, very funny, quite roguish, quite surprising quite often. He is an actual enigma, and it's part of what makes him so fascinating to watch, is precisely that there's so much mystery about him. He had such a massive physical presence, but he was delicate and, and always many-layered, this curious complexity. He was a towering figure to all of us young actors, without any question. Schofield liked to divide his time between public performance in London and an intensely private family life in the country. He gave very few interviews and was only occasionally glimpsed as himself on camera. He had absolutely no interest whatsoever in promoting Paul Schofield. He just wanted to work. He didn't like any kind of social activity, so he would never join in on that if he could avoid it. And he loved to go home after the show, always. Although being a theatre actor took first place, he also worked successfully in film, radio and television. That wonderful voice. The hippopotamus. I mean, it has to be the best voice ever for an actor. The broad-backed hippopotamus rests on his belly in the mud. Although he seems so firm to us, he is merely flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is weak and frail, susceptible to nervous shock. While the true church can never fail, for it is based upon a rock. Paul's voice was bred of oboes and bassoons, the wind section of the orchestra, but it was rich, compulsive, beautiful. The potamus can never reach the mango on the mango tree, but fruits of pomegranate and peach refresh the church from overseas. In 1967, Schofield captivated audiences as Sir Thomas More in the cinema version of Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons. Sir Thomas is here, Your Grace. Sir Thomas, Master Cromwell. More was the staunch Catholic who, on becoming Chancellor of England after Cardinal Wolsey, refused to agree to Henry VIII's divorce. Wolsey was played by Orson Welles. You opposed me in the council this morning, Thomas. Yes, Your Grace. You were the only one. Yes, Your Grace. You're a fool. Thank God there is only one fool on the council. Why did you oppose me? I thought Your Grace was wrong. A matter of conscience. You're a constant regret to me, Thomas. 
If you could just see facts flat on without that horrible moral squint, the little common sense, you could have made a statesman. I think he's the only actor who could entirely convince you that he was thinking, that he was a thinker, that he read a great deal, that he'd got a very alert and wary mind, and um, a lot of profundity, in other words, as well as being a complete human being. That was one of the exceptional qualities that he had and that made him so extraordinary in playing Sir Thomas More. Bolt's play presents Sir Thomas More as a man undergoing a crisis of conscience and determined to preserve his integrity on all counts. Thomas More enabled him to really portray one very strong element of his own character, which was integrity. I think it's like to the detriment of the more questionable, self-righteous side of Thomas More. You didn't sense that when you saw the film. You just sensed a man who, who, who would be, um, you know, afflicted for life if he didn't tell the truth. Why have I been called again? On a charge of high treason, Sir Thomas, for which the punishment is not imprisonment. Death comes for us all, my lords. Yes, even for kings he comes. The death of kings is not in question, Sir Thomas. No mine, I trust, until I'm proven guilty. Your life lies in your own hands, Thomas, as it always has. Is that so, my lord? Then I'll keep a good grip on it. Yeah. <laughs> I think the reason Scofield had this huge success in Man Four Seasons, both on stage and film, was that it, it brought out two of his great qualities. One was a moral gravity, and the other was this impish mischief. And this was the remarkable thing about Bolt's play. It reminded us that um, Thomas More wasn't merely a wise man and a, a shrewd man and a humane man who stood, obviously, by his principles. He was also a funny man, um, a funny man in the sense of an ironic man. I am a dead man. You have your will of me. Then the In the trial, Moore is condemned by the perjury of an ambitious former protégé, Richard Rich, played by a young John Hurt. There is one question I would like to ask the witness. That's a chain of office you're wearing. May I see it? The Red Dragon. What's this? Sir Richard is appointed Attorney General for Wales. For Wales? Why, Richard, it profits a man nothing to give his soul for the whole world. But for Wales. It's a comic line, and it gets a laugh in the cinema. But it's not the way he played it. Most actors would have said, Rich, it profits a man nothing to sell his soul for the whole world. But for Wales? I mean, that's the obvious comic way of playing it, but he didn't. He said, Richard profits a man nothing to sell his soul for the whole world, but for Wales. Very different, marvellous, brilliant interpretation, I thought. Such massive humanity. A Man for All Seasons triumphed at the Oscars, including one for its director, Fred Zinnemann. This picture took six Oscars, including the Best Actor Award for Paul Schofield. Receiving it on his behalf from Julie Christie, Wendy Hiller. A great achievement by British filmmakers. Eleven Oscars, the industry's supreme accolade. It was characteristic of Schofield that he declined to collect his Oscar himself. He always did his utmost to limit public appearances to work. Unlike many other greats in his profession, he refused to accept a knighthood though it was offered three times. I think he thought that meant he had to share himself with the public, share his private self with the public. And he really, really strongly felt the only right of access the public had to him 
was through his work. Throughout his life, Paul Schofield remained strongly attached to Sussex, the county in which he was born in 1922. He grew up in Hurstpier Point, where his father was headmaster of the local infant school. Paul was educated at Van Dean School in Brighton, where at the age of 13, he took to the stage for the first time in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Playing Juliet. At 17, Schofield began his professional career in repertory theatre. His progress was unhampered by World War II. He was rejected for service because of a toe defect. Good morning. Good morning. Keep your legs together. What are you trying to do, split yourself in two? I don't know, even the women are better than you are. From 1942, Schofield made his home at the Birmingham Repertory Theatre, built by the pioneering Sir Barry Jackson, a great discoverer of young actors. With new plays opening every four weeks, the company soon recognised Schofield's special talent. I was a young actor playing very small parts, and this new actor came to join the company, called Paul Schofield. And the first part he played uh, was in a Chinese piece or Chinese fable called The Circle of Chalk. And he played somebody called Prince Po. And I thought, oh, this is acting. Came across an old sorcerer and inquired of him concerning the nature of heaven and earth. He answered me, Brother, let heaven and earth instruct you. The three great powers are heaven, earth, and man. Schofield was also noticed by a young actress called Joy Parker. I thought how, how lovely he was. And then uh, we, he, I saw him uh, when I was shopping in Birmingham, and he crossed the road and we passed each other. And so I had a wonderful look, and I thought, isn't he wonderful? I don't think he noticed me at the time, crossing the road. Perhaps he did, I don't remember. And, uh, and that was it for me. And it must have been for him a little later. I was very fortunate. They married in 1943. His life with joy was, was everything to him. And they had this, this kind of completion. He had this which kind of sort of... as if that side of his life was taken care of. So he could devote all the rest of it to acting. A third person to have a major influence on Schofield's career was Peter Brook. He joined the company at the age of 20, fresh from Oxford University, to direct the young actor in Shaw's Man and Superman. The door opened. And I saw a face and a presence that was so striking and so unique that once I knew, ah, this is something remarkable, unlike anyone else, and really ageless. Already as a very young man, he was about 23, 24, lined, but in a strong way, which just gave him this tremendous character. Why do old faces get marked? It's because of all the experiences. And here you felt that he had lived through a thousand years of experience already before being born. In 1946, Sir Barry Jackson was appointed to run the Stratford Memorial Theatre. He took with him his favorites from Birmingham, John Harrison, Peter Brook, and Paul Schofield. 
Their dynamic productions of Shakespeare set a new standard in the theatre. It was a wondrous time. I mean, Paul said to me only recently before he died that that 46 season for him was the happiest time. And they had their first child and it was obviously a very happy time. I was like coming in, bright new boy, playing juvenile sports, and acknowledged totally that Paul was streets ahead of any of us. He always had that wonderful, craggy face. Lucky fellow to have had that face. Because we were all rather pretty when we were young, but not Paul. Paul never looked pretty. And in fact, I never thought he was very good in romantic parts. But um, his best thing, I think, for me, was Don Armado in uh, the, the Love's Day Was Lost. And I still have in my ear extraordinary thing. It was the definitive performance of that part. Lost rapier, be still a drum, for thy manager is in love. Yea, he loveth. It was, the, the, I, I still hear Paul saying it. Wonderful. Adieu, valor, rust rapier, be still drum, for your manager is in love. Yea, he loveth. He had this very special, rich, complex, very idiosyncratic voice of his own. And the word emerged because at that moment he was neither before nor after it. He was that absolute ideal for every artist. He lived the exact reality of that moment. So he wasn't at the moment that he spoke a word. If he said to be, the word be would not be the result of thinking about ideas of being or thoughts of being or even the vocal in inflection that that word needs or what it relates to the line. As he says be, he would be being. <laughs> and this would resonate through his voice in an extraordinary way. To be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. In 1955, Schofield played Hamlet under the direction of Peter Brook. The production made television news when it toured Moscow. First time that any of us have been to Russia, I mean, I think the first time that any English theatre company has been there since the revolution, certainly any Hamlet company. We're all, of course, extremely excited and happy about it. Well, now I wish you and your company every success. And particularly, I think Mr. Ernest Pesica is very well prepared. He's got a Russian hat on. Wonderful hat. a magnificent hat, sir, and congratulations. <laughs> we were treated so well. It was lovely. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Paul came on and they saw Paul young, dynamic, attractive. This was a revolution in the Moscow Art Theatre and he was treated like a pop star. For years, Russians would talk about Paul Schofield as the, for the young, the expression of a whole new possibility in theatre. On the first night, I said to him, you know, You'll have to make a speech. So he pre prepared on a scrap of paper a few words in Russian, and he learnt them and learnt them. And when, at the end, he came forward the curtain call, he began his first three words in Russian. Of course, they had an enormous effect. And then, the only time I've known him have a dry, and he unbuttoned his shirt and quite quietly 
took out this little scrap of paper, unrolled it, and read the rest. And of course, it was a stage effect which brought the house down. <laughs> Well, that was really quite extraordinary, the generosity, the hospitality, and the overwhelming kindness we found everywhere we went. Well, would you all like to go back to Moscow again? By the 1950s, the Schofields had settled in the village of Balcombe in Sussex. Their son, Martin, was joined by a daughter, Sarah. Paul wanted to live in the country, in the Sussex that he knew. Mm. He just loved it here, just loved it. Just loved the countryside, knew it very well. I packed my bag, I got my ticket, and I was on the train to Shangri-La. There's a palace to... The advantage of home life in Sussex was that it was only a short train ride away from the London stage. Because I had to get off the gravy train. In the 1950s, Schofield became a star of the West End. He even appeared in a hit musical, Expresso Bongo. Schofield always preferred the stage to the movies, and unlike his famous contemporary, Richard Burton, he turned down a Hollywood contract. Dress. Doesn't it make you envious? No, angry. Some people forget there's a war on. His first starring role in a British film was in Carve Her Name with Pride, the true story of wartime undercover agent Violette Chabot. Violette, you look ravishing that dress. If I didn't know you better, I'd say it was straight from Paris. French from head to toe. He was an understating actor. He never overdid anything. It was just this wonderful communication of what was in his heart and in his mind that just came out to you. And because it came out to you, it came out to the audience as well. He asked me for the lowdown on television acting, and I said, well, I think that a really good stage actor can usually act anywhere. Henry IV by Luigi Pirandello gave television audiences their first experience of Schofield in a classic drama. He played an actor whose apparent madness leads him to believe he's a medieval king. Under the direction of his old friend John Harrison, Schofield didn't shy away from giving a theatrical performance. The way he deals with some of those long speeches, shaping it, and sudden changes of tempo, sudden little lurching movements and sudden asides and dropping his voice down to a whisper and then bringing it right back up to a shout and theatrical, yes, but quite fabulous. I just sit back and wonder at it, really. I know that when I was a child, I thought the moon in the pond was real. How many things I thought real. I believed everything I was told. A child does, and I was happy. Because it's a terrible thing if you don't hold on to that which seems true to you today. To that which will seem true to you tomorrow. Even if it is the opposite of what seemed true to you yesterday. I would never wish you to think of this horrible thing which really drives one mad. But if you were beside another and looking into their eyes as I one day looked into someone's eyes. You might as well be a beggar before a door never to be opened to you. For he who does enter there will never be you, but someone unknown to you with his own different and impenetrable world. We'd only just had got a television, this lean, this big, you know, and a whole baker light all around. 
and turned it on and it caught caught my eye and I think I watched half the play just standing in the same spot without even sitting down. And then I went and sat down and watched the rest of it. I just remember being transfixed by it. Henry. Who is calling me? Henry. knew somewhere in the depth of my heart that I wanted to be an actor and this was one of the performances that completely made up my mind. I went to Stratford and I saw him in Time of Athens. All these years later I have still got an actual picture in my head of this gorgeous creature so beautiful, so sexy, with the voice that was like liquid heaven. I went back the next day to see the play again because I just was stunned at the effect that his acting had on me. And I decided then that I was def this was, was going to be the rest of my life. I was part of a school group, rather reluctant part of a school group, going up to see the Peter Brook production of King Lear. And I had a sort of... Damascus conversion during the course of the evening, um, you know, partly because of the, the beauty and austerity of the production, but partly because of this astonishing performance at the center of it. So he immediately became my favorite actor. These fragments of film are the only moving record of one of the most radical Shakespeare productions of all time one which completely transformed our understanding of King Lear. Peter Brook stripped away the sentimentality and bombast of previous interpretations of the play, such as those led by Sir Donald Wolfitt, the most famous Lear of the post-war era. Fortunately, Schofield's towering performance was preserved in a film version of King Lear, with Brooke recreating his stark vision in the wintry landscapes of Denmark. In Shakespeare's great tragedy, the aging Lear divides his kingdom among his three daughters. Goneril is corrupted by her new power, as is her sister Regan. Their growing ingratitude drives Lear into terrible rages. Unlike her sisters, Cordelia refuses to flatter Lear to win her inheritance and is banished. The daughters are a very powerful, intelligent woman who have their point of view. Each of the characters we approach with no judgment, but to find the reality of them which goes beyond the good and the evil. I do beseech you, understand my purposes are right. As you are old and reverend, should be wise. <laughs> Here do you keep a hundred knights and squires, as men so disordered, so debauched and bold, that this, our court, infected with their manners, shows like a riotous inn. Epicurism and lust makes it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. The shame itself to call for instant remedy. We always thought of Lear as a man more sinned against than sinning and surrounded by wicked daughters, Peter Brook showed us that actually the daughters had a case and that King Lear was surrounded by these riotous knights. So therefore, uh, Peter Brook forced us to suspend our usual moral judgment. Darkness and chaos. Saddle my horses. Oh, oh my king to get Schofield himself was quite extraordinary. He brought out the uh, autocratic side of King Lear. This man was ferocious. This man was 
uh, feral, testy, uh, savage, really, in those opening scenes. And what Scofield did quite brilliantly was to show the the humanity behind the autocracy and to gradually and only gradually reveal Lear's vulnerability. Stripped of his power, Lear descends into madness on the heath. Eventually, he's consoled by the daughter he rejected. Do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child. Cordelia. And so I am. I am. Beauty is wet. Yes, Faith. I know you do not love me. For your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. They have not. No cause. No cause. You must bear with me. Pray you now. Forget and forgive. I'm old. I'm foolish. Paul magnificently lived each of those stages. And there, once again, that was Paul being totally faithful to what the play was demanding. Peter will have a clear idea of how he feels the play ought to be presented. Within this framework, the actor, me that is, is free to find his own impressions and um, what I then contribute, he will incorporate. A friend of mine tried to get Paul, and this is a major folly, tried to get Paul to come along and deliver a talk at a, at a prominent um, lecture forum in, in London, uh, a talk about acting. And Paul sent this brilliant letter, which is extremely revealing, I think. He's, he said, I've found that an actor's work has life and interest only in its execution. It seems to wither away in discussion and becomes emptily theoretical and insubstantial. It has no rules, except perhaps audibility. With every play and every playwright, the actor starts from scratch, as if he or she knows nothing, and proceeds to learn afresh every time, growing with the relationships of the characters and the insights of the writer. When the play has finished its run, the actor is empty until the next time, and it's the emptiness which is, I find, apparent in any discussion of theatre work. I think it's completely brilliant, and that's, that's um, Paul's manifesto, and that's as near as you would ever get Paul to say, what is it that you actually believe about acting? Um, and, of course, it's all negatives. What I believe about acting is you have to do it in order to see what I believe acting is. He very rarely talked about it. I don't mean he kept, kept anything from me, but he didn't go into what obviously he was thinking about when it came to acting and playing. And I don't mean we didn't talk about it at all, but he didn't go into it in great depth. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are not going to read the play. Schofield devoted much of the 1960s to acting with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Your heads. Working closely with Peter Hall, he played not just the great tragic roles like Macbeth, but also comedies, from Gogol's Russian classic The Government Inspector to Staircase, a contemporary and at the time groundbreaking look at the life of two gay barbers. The play opened with two barbers' chairs, one man having his hair done, the other one with the immortal line, funny day, Sunday. Now that's in my poor imitation of Paul's accent. He was so funny and naughty, a naughty, naughty man. He would do some sort of wink or do some slight 
um, expression that would send us all into hysterics. And he would never, as they say, go corpse, never. But he would sometimes cause you to. And then he would just sail on. Schofield was not above practical jokes, even on an opening night. In Peter Schaffer's award-winning play Amadeus, he was cast in the role of the court composer Salieri, driven to murderous thoughts when faced with the arrival of the young genius Mozart, played by Simon Callow. There was a big scene in uh, Amadeus where Salieri appeared in front of Mozart wearing a mask uh, as dressed as death, basically, and Mozart then uh, uh, pleaded with death for more time to write. And there was, it's a long speech of Mozart's, and, and, and he says wonderful things like, you know, just give me another month, I promise. I promise if you give me one more month, I'll write a, a real piece of music. I, I'll write something good. I promise. I know nothing I've written before has been any good. And I was going like this, and of course, nerves and all that was fantastically running at a very high level on a press night of such a play with such a international attention. So I was saying all these things, and suddenly from behind the mask, Paul, inaudible to the audience, of course, said, oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> As Salieri, Schofield held the stage throughout the play, giving a tour de force display of a man's devastating recognition of his own mediocrity. This was testing, even for such an extraordinary actor, especially as the text was still unfinished as rehearsals began. Peter Schaffer is a wonderful writer, but who writes by constantly changing things. Um, and he would sit in rehearsal, scribbling away, while the actors looked out of the corners of their eyes and thought, Christ, there's another lot coming. And I remember it was about three or four weeks in that Peter pressed into Paul's hand a great wadge of new writing. And Paul just said terribly, terribly simply, no, I'm not learning another line. Just like that, the whole room, nobody could possibly have heard it. The temperature sunk to sub-zero levels. It was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> And so, of course, Peter Hall said, not absolutely, there's no need. No, I can't see why. But Peter Schaff said, uh, of course not, Rory, it's perfectly fine, is it? And I said, I'll say the line if you right. And then we were absolutely fine. That night, I heard Mozart's music for the first time. Some serenade for wind instruments, only vaguely at first, too horrified to attend. But presently the sound insisted, a solemn adagio in E-flat. It started simply now. There's a pulse in the lowest register. Bassoon and basset horn, like a rusty squeeze box. <laughs> it would have been comic except for the slowness, which gave it instead a sort of serenity. And then suddenly, high above it, sounded a single note on an oboe. It hung there, unwavering, piercing me through, till breath could hold it no longer. And the clarinet withdrew it out of me and softened it and sweetened it to a phrase of such delight it had me trembling. The lights flickered in the room my eyes clouded. The squeeze box groaned louder and over at the higher instruments wailed and warbled, throwing lines of sound around me. Long lines of pain around and through me. Oh, the pain. Pain as I had never known it. I called up to my sharp Old God, what is this? What? But the squeeze box went on and on, and the pain cut deeper into my shaking head, and suddenly I was running downstairs through the side door, out into the street, out into the dark night, gasping for life. What? What is this, Signore? 
What is there is pain. What is the need in the sound? Forever unfulfillable and yet fulfilling him who hears it utterly. Is it your need? Can it be yours? Dimly the music sounded from the salon above. Dimly the stars shone on the empty street. I was suddenly frightened. It seemed to me that I had heard a voice of God and that it issued from a creature whose voice I had also heard. And it was the voice of an obscene child. Peter Schaffer told me uh, a story of um, a performance of Amadeus and he thought Paul had done something transcendentally wonderful. And Peter Schaffer ran backstage to say, oh, it was transcendentally wonderful. And Paul, as he was talking, very, very gently and courteously shut the door of the dressing room in his face, simply, OK, enough. But, um, and I think that's so characteristic of Paul. Schofield never liked to socialise after performances a resolve that went back to an opening night party for his first West End play. When we got out, it was three o'clock in the morning, of course, after the first night. And we rushed home, and I can't remember how we got home. And um, Paul, the next morning, felt absolutely dreadful and said, I will never go to a party after the play, any play, again. And he never did. Got a call from the chairman of the Chichester Festival, and they said that they were interested in Paul Schofield to be the director of their festival for the next year, and he would do it if I would do it with him. And I thought, gosh, no, there's nothing I would like more than this. This would be absolutely wondrous. Paul rings me up, John, Chichester, forget it. We'd have to go to parties. So that was that. <laughs> he would be forever turning things down. He was the most difficult person to employ because he just didn't want to move out of his comfort zone. He wanted to be in the West End, get the train, go home to his home comforts. He was very, very keen on making his train. Never confirmed this, but I heard that he occasionally turned down plays on the grounds that um, uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't make the train. <laughs> He used to walk up from the station and I used to sit on the step and hear his footsteps coming through the path. And that was lovely. I loved sitting out there at midnight, after midnight, about 12, about 12, half 30, and hearing him come up. And you never heard anything, anyone else come up. <laughs> it was lovely. He was a very quiet man. I remember him saying to me once, he had a holiday home in Mull, in Scotland, and he said, it's such a good thing to get away from it all, but to get away from what? Balkan? He relaxed in very simple ways. He relaxed in family life. He relaxed in sitting down with a book and his pipe. He relaxed in walking with his dog of the time. There was one huge hound which used to terrify me, called Diggory, that he used to walk all over the Sussex Downs with, declaiming his lines. He used to say Diggory heard his lines. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What? Yellow soldier on. Hence, give hence. I have forsworn his bed and hunting. Tarry rash wanton. Am not I thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. But I know when thou hast stolen away from fair land. Apparently, he was offered the most extraordinary um, film uh, worth a very, very great deal of money in America. And he said, no, I can't possibly go because I've training Diggory. This is the dog, very young dog in those days. 
And they said, you must, don't you understand? It's, it's Oscar winning, it's this, that, the other, the other. Anything you want, cars, limos. He said, no, no, he said, you've got to explain to them, I'm training Diggory. Cannot do it, there's no question about it. Um, and, and that's what he did, he trained Diggory. I have to say, with not very successfully, because Diggory is a bit of an, a nightmare when people went to visit. He didn't want to have much else except to be here or to walk his dogs and to act. I think it was just that. I think that's possible, don't you? Schofield's last screen appearance was in a new version of Arthur Miller's classic drama, The Crucible. He played the fearsome, self-righteous Judge Danforth, the chief prosecutor in a trial of suspected witches in Salem in the 17th century. Judge Hortz. Judge Danforth. Judge Sewell. Sir. Mr. Paris. Your Honor. Mr. Paris. Paul was an actor who almost always, certainly in the latter part of his career, said no. But he always said no very quickly and very courteously, so it was always worth asking him. Can Miss Putnam? It turned out that when he said yes, he said yes equally quickly, and he said yes to the crucible almost immediately. Uh, and then when we met and had lunch to talk about it, uh, he said that he had said yes instinctively. Uh, he knew he wanted to do it, and then he tried to work out why, and he realized that the part in the crucible was the flip side of Thomas More. Oh, confound all this. I'm not a scholar. I don't know whether the marriage was lawful or not, but damn it, Thomas, look at these names. Why can't you do as I didn't come with us for fellowship? And when we die, and you are sent to heaven for doing your conscience, and I am sent to hell for not doing mine, will you come with me for fellowship? I assure you, gentlemen, that His Majesty's government is now determined that the devil shall not rule over one single inch of Massachusetts. And if, indeed, he has come here in Salem, is where we shall dig him out. The spiritual certainty of uh, Thomas More and the spiritual certainty of Judge Danforth in the Crucible, he saw as opposite sides of the same coin, and I was fascinated uh, by the fact that he thought that that was the thing that he had particular access to, that was the thing he thought he could shine a particular light on. Have you ever seen the devil, Mr. Proctor? No. And there is no desire lurking in your heart to undermine these investigations? No, sir, I come only to save my innocent wife and my friends. Daniel is grossly to oversimplify a method actor. Um, and the stories about how Daniel Day-Lewis prepares for a part are by and large true. And I think Daniel thought, uh, because of what Paul brought to all his performance performances, that, that that's how Paul would be. But when we rehearsed, Daniel, who was um, at that stage, grasping for some essential truth deep below the part, discovered that Paul came at it bluntly through vowel sounds. So while Daniel would be grasping around for some kind of uh, basic, basic handle on the part, Paul would be working out how it sounded. I said, we live in a new, a new, a new, a new time, a new time. And I've never seen an actor's face fall further than Daniel's face fell, because he thought that his idol had feet of clay. But the point is that as soon as they got onto the set together, as soon as the cameras were rolling, they were in exactly the same place. They just come from different directions. This is a new time, a precise time. We live no longer in the dusky afternoon when evil mixed itself with good and befuddled the world. Now, by God's grace, the good folk and the evil entirely separate. I hope you will find your place with us.
Throughout his life, Schofield had only one important aim, to be a good actor. Why, Richard, it profits a man nothing to give his soul for the whole world. But for Wales. To be or not to be, that is the question. That night, I heard Mozart's music for the first time. Forget and forgive. I'm old. I'm foolish. Schofield's last great performance was at the National Theatre when he was 74. Richard Eyre proposed he play the title role in Ibsen's John Gabriel Borkman, the story of relations between a ruined banker his wife and her sister. He wrote back by return of post saying, I've always wanted to play this part. Yes, I'd love to do it. Um, do you think there's any chance we could get Vanessa Redgrave and Eileen Atkins to... <laughs> so that was cast within a day. There's a wonderful picture in my mind of, of Paul waiting until he was due to come on the stage in rehearsal sitting in a nice big wooden chair, just leaning back. And obviously he was kind of listening, thinking, but he looked like a Michelangelo statue, really. If he talked to you for very long, you did rather hope that you wouldn't ever have to move away. He, he, he was someone that people fell in love with. Fell under his spell, I'd say, more than fell in love with. You fell under his spell. The play is about a titanic businessman who has a vision of, you'd have to say, the sort of growth of 20th century capitalism. I mean, a great industrial empire. Uh, and it's on the cusp of, of, of the 20th century. And he goes up to the top of a mountain and it's snowing and... He's, uh, he's dying and it's a sort of, it's like, almost like Lear on the Heath. And he has this extraordinary long speech about, uh, uh, about what he could have achieved. And Paul never quite switched on full power. And then in the first run through, he did it at full power and I was maybe, six feet away from him, sitting against the, the back wall of the rehearsal room, and he was at the front of the stage, marked out with tape. And he turned it on, and I've never seen anything like it. It was absolutely overwhelming. You know those moments in rehearsal, and it, there was an utter silence and the electricity round that room, as he did that speech, and you thought, yes, he's got it, he knows it, we're there. And now, in the still of the night, I shall whisper it. I love you. You who slumber, spellbound beneath the earth. I love you. Buried in darkness, you unborn treasures, yearning for life, I worship you! I love your dazzling retinue of power and glory. I adore you. Because there wasn't a precipice on the Littleton stage where we're now sitting. But um, I could believe that we were on a precipice and I could believe he saw what he said he saw far below him in the mountain valleys and ridges. Quite extraordinary. Wonderful, wonderful actor. I just wish we'd had a chance to work some more. John Gabriel Borkman was Schofield's final appearance on stage in a full-length play. No.
never, never, never. Oh, do you see this? Look on her. Look her lips. Look there. Look there. For me, he was, he was the most interesting, the most alluring actor of that generation. Um, that combination of resolve and toughness and intelligence and tenderness um, and a kind of um, sly wit um, and a thoughtful sly wit, uh, I thought put him well ahead. I mean, Horses for courses. I just adored him. Our relationship was so close, but I think he felt the same as I do. It was never social, and it didn't depend on the basis of show business relationships, which is the uh, evening out and the dinner and the drinks for that. It was never our relation. And the same with his wife, Joy. I mean, it was something, and with my wife, Natasha, we were always close and spoke about Paul and about Joy and about one another as though we saw one another all the time. And whenever I had a chance, I mean, whether he did plays, I saw them and saw his films and followed what he did quite naturally. So even today, he's close. In the same way. Our rebels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits, and are melted into air, into thin air, and like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud capped towers. The gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with the sleep. <laughs> 